everyone and welcome to worship online with Aurora United Church. It is Sunday, October 18th. Welcome. So to begin with, we want to thank everyone again for providing photos for our Thanksgiving photo montage from last week. They were really lovely uh, reminders of this time of the year, of course, and of celebrations from past years. And we hope that you enjoyed your celebrations wherever you were last week. A reminder today that Woman's Spirit will meet by Zoom uh, Monday evening and Book Club on Tuesday evening, both of them at 7 p.m. And uh, Zoom details are on our website, so if you have not received an email, please uh, call or email for the password and you're more than welcome to join us. Thanks to everyone participating in worship today. We have archived music from our AUC Chancel Choir and Friends also from the Bellissimo and Faith Appeal Handbell Ensembles and Friends, the Stewart family, Chris, Dory, Sophie, Abby, Graham, and Sherlock, and Janice Nolan. As well, thank you to our videographer today, Keegan Komar, and of course our video editor, Bob Kiriakides. Thanks all, and welcome. Hi everyone, uh, just a few things for me today. First of all, virtual coffee time continues every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. on Zoom. You can come in by video or by telephone. Please check the website and your email for all the information, including the passcodes. If you're having a problem getting in, you can email Lorraine or I. We always have our phones uh, beside us uh, to answer any questions as you're coming in. The annual meeting of the congregation is going to be held on Wednesday, November the 4th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And again, you can come in by video or telephone. So that's Wednesday, November the 4th, 7 p.m. in the evening. So please watch your email and watch the website for details that will be coming out this week. Virtual Coffee Time, the evening edition, begins on Monday, November the 2nd at 7 p.m. So again, watch your email, watch the website for all the details for our Virtual Coffee Time at night. And if you haven't filled out the survey, the information is still on the website, so please take a moment this week and fill out our congregational survey from the AUC Council. Thank you. And so we light our Christ candle and welcome the God whom we know in Jesus to be present with us in the Spirit this day. As we come into worship today, we acknowledge that we reside and worship on the traditional lands of the people of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. The Stewart family will call us into worship. Creator God, you have made the earth so that all may share in its yield and have abundant life. Among your gifts to your people are the soil and the water and the means to sow and reap. You plant in your people the seeds of compassion so they may share the earth's bounty with those in need. You keep us mindful that the world's people have a right to food and the means to produce it. In this time of harvest, O oh God, gather us in. Gather a care for one another and, and for your, your people everywhere. As we lift our voices in prayer, word, and song, let, let us worship. worship. Our opening hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. Thank you.
we so often end up talking about time and how time seems to tear away with us trying always to catch up. Finding the quiet center has to do with being mindful of God in our midst. Let us pray together. Mindful that October days bring so much change, God of the seasons, we are caught up in it all. Shorter days and longer nights have us shifting our energies. In the midst of it, we recognize the astounding beauty of your earth. Happy that in Canada, we can experience the changing seasons by their color and temperature. As harvest progresses towards its end, we are aware of other harvests in this time and acknowledge that as we journey together, the gathering in of community will bring emotional and spiritual abundance to those in need. Uniting hearts and hands means reaching into the places where you would have us go, even in this changed time of isolation. Compassionate God, send us in Jesus' name. Amen. God continually invites us to renewed visions of wholeness. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our story today is called Potato, Eggs, and Coffee Beans. And so in the story, the question is, are you a potato, an egg, or a coffee bean? And what do these things teach us about life? Enjoy. One day as Chef David was cooking up something scrumptious for lunch, his daughter walked into the kitchen with something on her mind. What's wrong? The father asked. School is just so hard. Making friends is impossible. I don't think I'll ever make it through fourth grade. Her dad smiled and took out three pots. He filled them with water and placed them on the fire. Once the three pots began to boil, he placed potatoes into one pot, eggs into the second pot, and poured coffee beans into the third pot. Dad, what are you doing? Patience, sweetheart, patience. After 20 minutes, he took the potatoes out of the pot and placed them on a plate. He did the same with the eggs, and then he poured the coffee into a mug. So, what do you see? Potato, eggs, and coffee. Ah, look closer. The potatoes, the eggs, and the beans each face the same adversity, boiling water. However, each one of them reacted differently. The potato went in strong, hard, and unrelenting but in the boiling water became soft and weak. The egg was fragile, with the thin outer shell protecting its liquid interior until it was placed in the boiling water. Then it became hard. However, the coffee beans were unique. After they were exposed to the hot boiling water, they changed it and created something new. Which are you? He asked his daughter. When adversity knocks on your door, how do you respond? Are you a potato, an egg, or a coffee bean? In life, things happen around us, things happen to us, but what truly matters is what happens within us. Which one are you? Janice Nolan has our first scripture lesson today. In gratitude to the people, Paul emphasizes the power of the word and spirit to transform our lives. I'm reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, 
that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake and you became imitators of us and of the Lord for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus who rescues us from the wrath that is coming the word of God for the people of God amen today is taken from the gospel according to Matthew. I'm reading from the 22nd chapter verses 15 through 22, where Jesus is questioned by the religious authorities in an effort to catch him out. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's 
and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Thanks be to God for these words of scripture. Amen. So I invite you to come to the quiet of whatever space you experience as sacred in this time. Just letting the words of the gospel resonate within yourself, letting the quiet take you to an openness of spirit. Come to the quiet. To all that is chaotic in you, let there come silence. Let there be a calming of the clamoring, a stilling of the voices that had laid their claim on you, that have made their home in you, that go with you even to the holy places, but will not let you rest, will not let you hear your life with wholeness or feel the grace that fashioned you. Let what distracts you cease. Let what divides you cease. Let there come an end to what diminishes and demeans, and let depart all that keeps you in its cage. Let there be an opening into the quiet that lies beneath the chaos, where you find the peace you did not think possible and see what shimmers there. Amen. Coming away from a long weekend past that had us working at our creative best to be thankful and grateful by loving our loved ones, by staying away from them. Family and friends found ways to connect nevertheless. For some that meant a meal with only those living with us. Others took to the outdoors, eating together uh, with family and friends uh, in the backyard or on the deck, or taking walks around our local trails or venturing out to uh, local apple orchards. Zoom and telephone visits were happening for many families throughout the Thanksgiving weekend, having made do with what was available to us, another memorable event. As the air continues to chill and the days darken towards yet another seasonal change, we have so much on our minds. Life at home or at work or work at home, kids and youth in school, changing virus numbers and government plans to cope with it all. The state of our churches and businesses, including employees who are suffering in this time. The state of our hospitals and of our frontline workers who care for us in clinics and hospitals and who make sure we have food and other essentials to keep our communities functioning. As life rolls on, in the background, just below the surface, are the abiding concerns that affect us all. Concerns about day-to-day -day living and what the future will bring. And it's that given we share in this time. And we do. I wonder if your Thanksgiving prayer around whatever kind of circle or or table at which you found yourself last weekend. I wonder if it sounded something like our family's prayers, that in naming those things for which we were thankful or grateful, ended up sounding very much the same. So much of one mind we seem to be. I'm so thankful that we're together. 
that we had each other. Which took us to talking about family members and, and others that we knew would be alone and reminding each other to make sure to connect in some way, asking if they would have the opportunity to visit with a, a neighbor or friend in some way. In that vein, it was so wonderful to see that so many of our area churches, missions and restaurants made sure that anyone in need of a Thanksgiving meal got one, along with friendly conversation and music too. If you have found your emotions to be heightened in this time, know that you are not alone in this. It is well within our human experience that when we are deeply, seriously challenged, we go in ourselves to what matters, to what is essential, to use uh, this kind of day word. And what is essential to us is our relationships. Beyond whatever is happening that takes us to fear or concern on any given day are the people that bring meaning to our lives. And being separated from those we love is a hollowing out we may never have experienced before. Felt especially in times when we normally would be gathered around our family tables in celebration. And so we've ended up marking certain times, events, and seasons in ways that are entirely new to us. Our energies have shifted in relation to everything else that exists in this strange and challenging time. As the days seem to be passing so quickly now, we are more mindful than ever that our American neighbors are struggling in a number of ways where the virus has taken a terrible toll and the political battle for the presidency is counting down to what some have called a final reckoning is just a few weeks away. Regardless of what our own political leanings may be, as people of faith, we have seen how politics and religion can create a pitched battle of push and pull that can be distressing to observe or to experience, especially if it is not our politics or our political views. Politics and religion, around and around we go. November 3rd can't come fast enough, if only for us to be relieved of the suspense as Canadians. Now imagine living there. Religion has been a significant player in the race to the White House. We've seen it playing out over these many months, if not years. Now being infused into the proceedings to name the next American Supreme Court judge before the election. There is still in this, even in this 21st century, some, some remnant of the opinion about keeping religion and politics separated out from each other. And I never, I've never understood how that would work entirely. It seemed to me, even, even as a really young person, that Jesus always seemed to be right in the middle of things, both politically and spiritually. In truth, we are the people we are in all of our complexities and beliefs and allegiances, wherever we go in this world. For instance, we don't, we don't leave the world at the doors of our churches while we go into worship as if that world had nothing to do with what we do, what we do as church, in or out for that matter. Our faith is meant to inform all we do and say and are, and what we hold as value, in what is good and ethical, moral and true. As those who are tied or aligned with the United Church of Canada, perhaps it's the case that we hold a particular understanding of the dance that exists between religion and politics, as it has always been a part of who we are, being the so-called social gospel church we continue to be. 
With that in mind, when the religious authorities, and today it's the Pharisees and the Herodians, when they sidle up to Jesus today, we are reminded that we are familiar with how this kind of scenario always plays out. Ever and always, someone somewhere is trying to catch Jesus off balance so that he will condemn himself and they can arrest him. On the face of it, the passage from Matthew's gospel is about taxation. But as always, there's so much else at work. On the one hand, the Pharisees see the tax as heretical, tax paid to a pagan king. And the Herodians saw the refusal to pay the tax as an act of sedition. So the question posed to trick Jesus somehow was this. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And I wonder then if it was part of Jesus' manner to let these kinds of questions just kind of hang in the air for a while. It certainly puts him in an interesting situation. He knows they're not asking because they're just curious. They are asking from a place of pure malice. That is malice with a big smile and flattery. <clears throat> We know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth. And so it begins. So Jesus takes a Roman coin, a coin that honors the Roman emperor as a deity, as a God, and offers the Pharisees and the Herodians a both and kind of answer. Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Brilliant, right? To not only respond to their challenge with a greater challenge, but also to insist that the relationship between faith and politics is, is too complex to reduce to simple platitudes. Jesus does not say here that there are two realms, the religious and the secular, or that they require equal fidelity. What he says is much more subtle and complicated. The coin is already the emperor's. You can see it, there's his face right there on it. So give it to him, give it to him. But then consider what then belongs to God. What kind of tribute then do we owe to God? We have been taught when we have read in Genesis, in the beginning, that we were created in the image and likeness of God. We owe God everything. We cannot separate Caesar's realm or whatever modern day Caesar equivalent. We cannot separate the realm, that realm, from God's realm when everything belongs to God. And if everything belongs to God, then our spiritual lives and our political lives have to cohere. They must not contradict each other. And haven't we seen over time how this happens? That contradiction happens all the time. If we really belong to God, if we really are fashioned in God's image, then we need to practice our faith and our politics in ways that reflect who God is. And long after earthly empires have risen and fallen and risen and fallen again, ever the way of history, God's realm will remain. The realms of the Caesars of this world are limited and temporal, earthly, where God's realm is eternal and all-encompassing. In a time when the future feels fragile, there is great 
promise and reassurance in that. Give to God that which is God's. That is everything. Amen. Our hymn, Love is the Touch. support of Aurora United Church. Your gifts continue to support the church here and around the world. Through your faithful commitment, we continue to be the hands and feet of Christ in this time and in this place. God calls us to respond in faith, to be stewards of great resources, to live respect, respectfully, responsibly, and responsibly, to share love and grace. Let us pray. God, you have spoken and we have answered. Accept our gifts as a token of our thanks for all the blessings that surround us. May these gifts be an inspiration to us and others to build a better world in which all have enough. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, we connect with the fullness we call God. In the presence of the one who walks with us, I invite you to gather your concerns unspoken in the silence of these prayers and offer them to God. Let us pray. Creator God, you who are the maker of all the earth, we rejoice in your work. You have crafted your plan with much care, laying out our responsibilities and caring for ourselves, others, and creation, and making the consequences of our actions clear. May the things we do and say always be acceptable to you, for it is ultimately you who we long to please. You are the grounding of all that is. You walk with us through day and night, gently guiding us along the path with love, sharing your wisdom and your forgiveness when we stumble. Today we offer thanks for the ministry of the Riverbend Integrated Community Ministry in Saskatoon and the Ecumenical Christian Council of Guatemala. Great Spirit, there are many others in this world who need your care. We pray for the homeless, the hungry, the poor, the sick, the hurting, and the grieving. We pray for the peacemaker, the nurturers, the caretakers, all those who are working to make this a more compassionate and loving world. Dear wise one, may we remember that we are the living messengers of your loving embrace. London God, be with those that yearn for your restoration and healing. 
thee we ask your blessing upon. Hold in your care, Lori, Carol, Faith, McKinley, Tracy, Viola, Jean. God, conspire us to create a world where all have access to nutritious and sustainable food sources, and none live with scarcity or food insecurity. Mobilize us to be a part of a world response that works in partnership with those of goodwill to foster equitable resource sharing. Cultivate our resilience and expand our imaginations so that we might continually find new ways to answer the call to end hunger until all may flourish. We hold before you the floods and lives lost in Southern India, for the firefighters, residents, and students in Tanzania in the area of the National Park, for those threatened by and those fighting the continuing wildfires in California, for those on the Gulf Coast battered by yet another hurricane, for the people of Kashmir and Nagorno-Karabakh. We pray for many European countries and other places in our province and our country who are returning to full or partial lockdowns and a number of pharmaceutical firms which have halted their COVID-19 vaccination trials. God, help us to follow Jesus who reached across ethnic boundaries. Help us to break down the barriers in our community. Enable us to see the reality of racism and bigotry and free us to challenge and uproot it from ourselves, our society, and our world. Tender and caring creator, accept these, the prayers of your people, prayed in the strong name of Jesus, the one who joins us on the journey and who taught us to pray together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, Dear Weaver of Our Lives Design.
God of the changing earth, root us deep. God of the ripened fields, harvest our compassion. God of us all, let love and justice be known in us as we travel on. And now may the blessing of God, giver of every good and perfect gift, the blessing of Christ, redeemer of the lost and broken, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in our lives, be with each one of us and all whom we love and serve. Amen. I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor chord, the major lift, the bad for king. Oh